It's Tuesday on Your View. Welcome to the show. I am Murayo Afolabi Brown. As always, I have the ladies with me. Hello, Mariam Lunge. Hi. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Um, so this morning, my daughter was like, it's your birthday week and you're not excited, you're not... I'm like, but I'm excited. She says, if, I was, if it was me, hmm. I would be excited every minute. I'll mark Jesus. every day. Jesus. And, you know, it just made me realize that, um, you know, the way we were just brought up what are very different from yeah. her. For me, is it was always don't bring too much attention to yourself, don't, you know, yeah. and be mindful of other people, be modest in all your, yeah. in your emotions and your, you know, things like that. And I remember there was a time I was trying to sort of do that with her and someone said to me that, no, just let her be, you know, mm -hmm. and let her just be her full self. And she's such a joy to wow. hear and listen. And even though I'm mother, I think I'm learning from her. Yeah. Yeah. So my birthday is on Saturday. Yes, so yeah. I <laughs> I mean, I think I have the same similar thing. I just, yeah. I never had that pump. Yeah. Though my mother did. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just never. This tomorrow. Actually. Yeah, and my brother is tomorrow, but you see, and I, I woke up this morning and I was just, I was just breaking down because I felt that listen, it's my first birthday without my mom. We shared the birthday, and I'm always knowing that she yeah, calls me like we're together. It's not just me, and this time it's just me, and it's so it wasn't for me. And even order cake, I'm like, I'm not even interested. I'm not. Even, but we'll, we'll try to celebrate. We thank God. It's, we thank mm. God for life. It's, it's uh, We'll see how that goes. How are you doing, Tokwe? I'm good. I'm grateful to God for life and I'm grateful to God for opportunity to be a blessing. I, I do um, a teaching series on social media, Money Mondays, and I really enjoy teaching. Aww. I really, really enjoy teaching. Like, so yes, I had um, a live, somebody invited me to a live interview between mm. seven and eight, and then I had to do eight to nine. And I finished and I still felt very like, like energized, I've had a very busy day. At 9 p.m., I, I could still have continued tilt. I just love teaching, and I feel blessed able to find myself doing things I love to do. So grateful to God, really grateful that's to good, God. That's good. good. That's good. life anyway. That's why it seems like you're playing when you're doing what you yeah. love to do. Yeah. Hello, BC. How are I'm you? I'm doing amazing. Neil. Thank I've you. I've seen you in a, ah, she's been a very long time. I've been coming ah. to work now. You know, so I've not seen her in a while. You haven't made okay, a set. Yes, okay, we haven't made a set together, but I've been coming to work. I went there, like, it's been a while I've seen you. Excuse me, it was just... <laughs> well, I've been seeing her on Instagram. She's been oh, acting. I wasn't seen her. Uh -huh. I didn't oh, you made a, yeah. an appearance. I didn't talk oh, about it. Oh, my I saw it. Oh, my Jiro. Trying to be acting, talking about a kiniko, kiniko. Rich man said, if you want to see Mariam's acting skills, go and watch my Jiro. She was good. Yeah, I'm doing great. So I'm rounding up Picture Perfect. I think I have just one more day on set. Oh, hallelujah. Told me the day, me too, yes. we, are, okay. we are happy for you. Yeah, you've, been, you. you've been locked down. Yes, I have been. I have been, and it's been good. At the same time, I'm trying to um, get ready for some of the events that I have coming up. And we're supposed to also be planning our own event. So everything mm. is just lined up one after the other. But um, I'm getting the rest as well as working, and I'm looking forward to more things. More scripts. Directors, send in the scripts. Send in the scripts. <laughs> yeah. I can tell you, I'm not as modest as they are. I can tell you. <laughs> Well, tomorrow is my birthday, and yeah. I didn't plan anything. That's Don't cool. worry. I didn't plan Jack. Don't but worry. I, I just wanted to wake up tomorrow and thank God, um, bring you guys to you know hang out, pray, thank God, and that's it. I'm not. I but didn't order something. cake. If you come, there's no cake. No. And yeah, there'll be cake. Don't worry. As I have announced now, cake will be. No, there's no one. I'm not even interested. <laughs> no. She will buy cake. They just pray for me and yeah. just thank God. Mm. With that said, let's go on a break. When we come back, we go through the front pages of the papers. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Your view will be right back. All right, we're going to start with the nation. Bikes camp gives IU must go condition to back Atiko. White Unibu will succeed Buhari by Oshio Male. Ipman Federal Government Agency face off to worsen petrol scarcity. Denny Bank is Nigeria's best at World Finance Awards. <coughs> Um, Akira Dolu, okay, self-defense. MMA runway to be shot. Okay, which story are we starting with? Um, sh let me give us a little update on the Ondo church members. Remember the um, members of the whole Bible Believers Church. And um, the update is that many of them have refused, even though the police is involved now and they're on camera, they have refused to leave the church until 
they speak with their pastor and he, he you know, tells them about what he had promised them, the second coming of Christ. Um, the police were saying that the children that were in that basement were aged between 7 and 17 and that some of them were speaking so boldly about the second coming of Christ. They had no fear in them, so much confidence mm. that it seemed like they had been clearly hypnotized. A man talked about his pregnant wife who refused to leave the place. She said he, she even had her baby there and has refused to come home. Hey. Wow. A man talked about his son who is in university who went there and has refused to leave the basement. Wow. They're just different stories of people that, you know, I think just realizing that so many family members were refusing to come home was mm. what broke the story. So uh, they say it seems that they've been hypnotized and um, hopefully the man will unhypnotize them or hey. they have to be taken to a rehabilitation center mm. to cure them of this. Okay, scary. so let me take the major headline. We can, so, <clears throat> the issue going on in PDP <laughs> is yet to be resolved because... Governor Wike is insisting that the current chairman of the PDP, National Chairman Iyochia Ayu, must step down for there to be peace in that party. And the presidential candidate, Atiku, is insisting that he can't step down now until after the election because they need him to able to get the swing state. I didn't even realize we have swing states tonight. <laughs> so the swing states are, let me just in case, from Thank PDP's you. perspective, the swing states are Rivers, Lagos and Kano. How is Lagos? How are they state? swing states? Eh? Lagos and APC. Well, let me not start with that assumption, but they are saying the swing states are swing towards swing, where? swing that, that they, okay, might, they, get, have, they might get. They might get the PDP votes. They have a strong Labour Party, so I'm wondering. Yeah, yeah so swinging. So, so they are saying that or... Rivers, Lagos, and Kano are swing states. Really, I never knew that. Okay, well, that would be interesting to see. But Atiku is insisting yeah, that the votes are usually really really close. Mm. They're pretty close. Yeah. So yeah. They, could, they, they could swing either way. So swing could be, they could swing along party lines, along ethnic lines, those sort of things. No, 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 no. no it's the no, votes. No, no. It's the votes. Because no, it's, yes, it's, it's the votes. It's the votes. It's the votes. There's also a possibility that they could be ethnic. Yeah. yeah. Party yeah. or according to ethnicity. Because if you look at the numbers in Lagos sometimes, no, they, they, they are just Those close. states have gone from APC to PDP. Yeah, so, they, so, so those are swings. Hmm. Anyway, so that's, that's the condition. Swingers. So they've, they've um, engaged none other than um, former Senate Promise President Bukola Saraki to lead the delegation. Hmm. Governor Wicked, you can't tell him. Hmm. And give his having this so stand for him the vice president. No, they're not. They're still they're trying to lobby to talk to him to, to come to an, an understanding, pedal, yeah. to calm down. So Governor Wicked, as party. we know Governor Wicked to be. So that he can work for the party. He needs the numbers he can control as well. <laughs> Governor Wicked is just he's, he's, he's an institution. Yes, he is. <laughs> okay, go ahead. So the Federal Airport Authority of Nigeria have said that they will close the 2.7 kilometer domestic runway of the Motala Mohammed Airport to enable them effect installation of the runway airfield lighting. Um, they also mentioned that the lighting components of the domestic runway have been absent since the facility was rehabilita rehabilitated in 2008. And so they are saying that um, the um, airport's uh, runway may be closed from Thursday, July 7th, and work will commence without disruption. So they are, um, I think the airport operators are trying to have like an emergency meeting to determine how the closure would affect the activities at the airport. So let me talk about it, man. The petrol crisis isn't going to get away anytime soon. The Independent Petroleum Marketers Association of Nigeria has um, said they might be going on, they might be um, going on strike. They might be considering a strike option. This is because they are demanding payment for the bridging gap, um, which is like the transportation. So when they are moving fuel from, let's say, Lagos, where you have the depots to Abuja or to any other state, the transport cost is a bridge gap and it must be paid by the Nigerian midstream downstream petroleum regulatory authorities. They claim to have paid 74 billion naira already, which didn't go down well. And they are the, the Ipman is now threatening that they will shut down. And this might happen this week. We're expecting that a meeting will take place um, between the government, the between the government and IPAD, the complaint is that over the past 12 months, the bridge gap fund is the, right. the IPAD are claiming that they are being owed the bridge gap fund for that much, and that this money is not covering what um, um, the money right. that they say they are, they've paid is not covering what is expected to come to them. Okay, let me move quick on to the punch. 20 directors just so to replace fired AGF. Traffic lights help policemen, last mile officers extort motorists in Lagos community. Um, INEC laments as arson is burned in Ugu office. Kids rescued from Undo Church demand pastor's release. Islamic cleric bags life imprisonment for defiling the eight-year-old. FG issues guidelines for ret to retain all sector spending in Nigeria. 
Lagos Court remands woman for brutalizing 11 year old over 1,000 naira. I wish I wanted to tell that story. Yeah, I did. And uh, 139 clerics worshippers killed, 394 kidnapped in 18 months. There's report. Um, 20 wrecks retire in, in August as tenure ends, and solid minerals imports rise by 74% in 12 months. Okay, which story? Let's start with um, okay, your story. Yes. So, a uh, woman called Eunice Agboye has been um, arraigned and remanded in custody for brutalizing her ward. He's an 11 year old who's lived with her for three years. And on this particular occasion, she had given him a thousand naira to do something. And he came home because, and told her he had lost it and that she took a, I don't know if it was some sort of wire or cable and that she bit him so bad he's got, he was seriously injured on his buttocks, all over his body. Um, thankfully, um, she was arrested for that. She went to court, she pleaded not guilty, and even though her counsel had asked for bail, um, the court refused to let her go on bail. So that's it. I mean, it's good that we're taking things, um, you know, seriously like that. I don't know if she has other children and who's watching the other children, but obviously I feel that this is someone that really needs um, some sort of counseling and therapy with, um, you know, mental issues right. or anger management. Okay, so I'm going to take the picture story. On Sunday, the INEC office in Enugu State was burnt by, yes, it, uh, unknown, unknown gunmen. Unknown gunmen. Or, um, the unknown arsonist, right? Um, the spokesperson for INEC or the INEC National Commissioner for Chairman Information Voter Education, Mr. Fessel Okoye, who's been on our show before, said that the arsonists were overpowered. Uh, the, no, the arsonists overpowered the security guards and forced their way into the premises and set ablaze everything. No lives were lost, thank God, but 748 ballot boxes were burnt, 240 voting cubicles destroyed, um, the offices and furniture also destroyed in the fire. And this is really sad because we're trying to get the continuous voter registration going ongoing, especially in the Southeast, who are, because we're hoping that more youths across the country can get registered to vote. But now they've burned down the Enugu office, and many, even the, the machines, the voter registration machines also were destroyed alongside other things. So it's, it's, it's a sad development, and the commission is concerned about these unprovoked attacks on their offices in Enugu being the latest, and however, they, they have reported the matter to the police, and they are confident that the security agencies are capable of finding this um, arsonist. So there are no cameras around that could have yes. picked up on who... They will burnt down the camera probably. In con it's still in line with INEC stories. Um, about 20 um, wrecks are, go are going to be retiring. So the wrecks are the um, resident electoral commissioners and their tenure is expiring. They have a five-year tenure. They were sworn in around 2017 by the president and 20 out of 20 27 of them, some of them have already served the second term so they don't even get option of being I'm right. coming back again, and between July 7, they are leaving by August. So the concern I'm reading here is that they hope the president has been informed that there would be vacancy within that place, considering that we're entering an election year. I don't believe this is the time to have such any gap. The moment they are stepping out, there should already be someone that is going to even be, they'll be handing handing over, over to. to. But they have to go through screening. So if the names are not out by now, the likelihood is 20 people would exit the electoral commission and, the and, they, and they will be left open. We really okay, let's go to the country. Come way. back. Continue with our review. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Your view will be right back. Thanks for staying with us. We're still reviewing Punch. You had a story? Yes. So a group of police officers and men of the Lagos State Traffic Management Authority last month have been caught in extortion scheme using the traffic light at the Sherry Bega area of Lagos State. So uh, Punch Metro had been receiving uh, numerous complaints from motorists. And so on the 28th of June, they decided to, you know, wear like a camouflage and observe what has been happening. So the particular correspondent who... Uh, took note of this, was disguised as a hawker who had something. He, she was, uh, I think, selling popcorn with a nose mask and was there for over four hours observing how the syndicate were operating. And they found that um, they, what they did was the green light just comes on for just a few seconds while motorists are still ongoing. And then it stops 
uh, without having any form of countdown and every other person is caught in the middle. And then they take these people, uh, telling them that they have committed a traffic offense. They take them to POS and they'll be withdrawing us from 10,000 to 60,000 naira from these people. What? They would threaten them that they are going to take them to the office and this, everything was just happening that way for a long time. The matter was taken to uh, the PPRO of uh, Lagos State and he was saying that he's not aware that any form of extortion is ongoing. And um, if people are, have the evidence, they should present it so that they can fish out these um, officers and, you know, met out punishments to them. They also said that what, he, what he's noticing from the complaints that probably the traffic light has a fault, but nobody has reported and that will be fixed. I was caught myself on, I think it was on Saturday, and we just saw the green light. Before we realized it, it was red in the middle. And then they said they were taking us to the office. I said, I'm not coming down from this car. I'm not going to any office. This was too soon because it was just green yeah. right away. But then they sent me a receipt <laughs> of, uh, that I have to come and pay 20,000 naira and all of that. Just I hear a lot of people are complaining yeah, about it, yeah. that particular spot. You need to fix and that. And I was listening on radio. The same spot? Yes. And, uh, Sherry? I was, yes. I was listening on radio because it wasn't the newspaper review and they said that this is something that many people have been complaining about. about. And the response. I like that Punch is, took somebody there. Yes. They actually disguised as a hawker. Mm. And I'm sure they have recorded. I'm, I'm sure they probably they recorded mm. um, it and I have evidence to show. So they need to. Um, okay, moving on quickly to the Daily Sun. Vice presidential slot at Feniferi, MBS, um, Islamic clerics reject Muslim Muslim ticket. <clears throat> Religious ethnic intolerance. Sultan, can Methodist bishop others move to douse tension? INEC expresses worry as arsonists attack Inungu office. Amateko will go after terrorists in Southwest Forest, says Akiri Dolu. 52 Edo communities shot NPPC office with coffin. Really? Another Catholic priest kidnapped in Kaduna. Abga praises Soludo over fight against insecurity. Zenith emerges best global corporate governance bank. Okay, which story are we starting with? Akiri Dolu? Who else? Yes, so the Ondo State Governor, Uluwaro Timi Akiri Dolu. San has said that uh, members of the Southwest Security Outfit Amoteku will no longer wait for headsmen and bandits terrorizing the state to attack the people, but they are going to be taking the battle into the forest. He said that um, he has observed that the criminals have been coming with um, sophisticated uh, equipment and guns, and so uh, governors should find means to acquire their own sophisticated weapons to fight. That it, this is not the time for people to be sitting down and waiting for the fight to be brought to them. That um, Ogun State um, uh, citizens need to begin to fight for themselves and speak out for themselves, and they are not going to take this anymore. So he was speaking during the Politics Today uh, program at, um, on the television, and he said that um, um, we're not allowing, uh, criminals are allowed to acquire illegal weapons, but Nigerians who would have the right to acquire uh, legal weapons are not allowed to do so. And so we need to look into how Nigerians can be allowed to acquire legal weapons so that they can fight for themselves. But right now, that sounds if on those states... <laughs> sounds like what Matawale was saying. Yes. Please let me All right. the story of Go the ahead. 52 um, communities shut down the NPDC office in Edo State. So the NPDC is Nigerian Petroleum Development Company. Their office is on Airport Road in Bini City. And the allegations from over 50 communities in Edo State under the platform concerned Edo youth yesterday barricaded the office saying they are not, they are being marginalized. That in terms of local content, they have written several letters to NPDC that employ our youths. We have competent people. We have um, people from, our, from the host communities where you are who have studied who have sent CV and you don't employ them. They also complain about the fact that the NPDC building rehabilitation that is in Edo State was awarded to a company in Kaduna State. And they felt that's wrong. We have contractors in Edo State that can rehab re um, rehabilitate that building, but their, con their um, applications were denied. And the contract was given to someone who has a portfolio company. According to them, the company in Kaduna doesn't even exist. Hmm? They also mentioned how... Um, to cut the grass within the facility that the OBA gave the NPDC land. And they are saying, give host communities the contracts to cut the grass within our community, but they are bringing foreigners to come and cut the grass. And because of this and many other reasons, they've decided to barricade the um, building. They brought a cow. I'd like to hear the from the NPDC because I've, seen, cut, I've heard this kind of stories before. And they slaughtered the cow's head in front of the building. They wore red outfits. They said, we want to be represented in I, your I, I, I studied, there was a case study of something similar where 
the company came out and said, listen, we've done, we actually did try to, I'm not saying this in this case, I'm just yeah. saying an example. Mm -hmm. We did try to engage host communities, but they had this entitlement that, listen, it's ours, and they didn't do the job as well. they, they should. So there are different, different angles, but I would like to hear from the NPDC know exactly what's reason, going on. Yes. It's good to hear both sides of the story. Mm -hmm. But there was a story that caught my attention, but let me let you go first. Yeah, right. so the federal government has reconfirmed that the, there's a certain criteria for admissions into our federal government um, colleges. That's what we know as Unity Schools, 110 of them. And they say that it's 60% of the admission will be based on national merit, 30% will be on equality of states, while 10% will be on exigency. And they were just reiterating it um, recently. And this was made by the a spokesperson for the Minister for Education. Um, they also said that um, the admission is it's supposed to, admissions into Unity Schools is really supposed to reflect what our, the, our founding fathers have always wanted, which is national integration and unity. And so this criteria will constantly be followed. I guess this must have come up because people constantly, you know, complain about how um, admissions are given to people who maybe otherwise don't make the cut-off mark and things like that. But 60%, is this for merit, is that enough? Should we make it 80 for yeah. merit? Yeah, let's merit prove merit their position. Mm -hmm. Okay, Nigerian Tribune, we can't take too much stories here. Lagos residents consume 4.5 billion naira food daily, says Sawonlu. Uh, FG was too quick, too quick to blame ISWAP for the our church attack. Alleged Christians' persecution, FG replies five U.S. senators. Oh, I wish I read that story. Zenith Bank retains position as Nigeria's best commercial bank. Uh, in those church saga, our children have been hypnotized, refused to go home, parents cry out. Um, income tax returns, FIRS extends due date for companies. Hajj, Saudi authorities extend landing permit for Nigerian pilgrims. Is there any story? Very short. Yeah. Um, Ni Nigerian pilgrims, a lot of um, Muslims going for Hajj were stranded at the Lagos, especially at the Lagos airport, because they didn't have the landing. The carriers, the Umbrella National Hajj Commission of Nigeria, couldn't get landing permit for Nigerian carriers to drop them at um, the for the Hajj. But now the Saudi Arabia government has extended from July 4th to July 6th, so those that want to travel now have permission to go. According to the Ni National Hajj Commission of Nigeria, about 43,000 pilgrims are expected to arrive in Saudi Arabia from Nigeria. The Federal yeah. Inland Revenue Service um, also extended the due date for filing of company income tax returns for the 2022 year of assessment, which was supposed to be due June 30, 2022 to August 31, 2022 for companies who were unable to meet up with the deadline. So um, they are saying that um, uh, this is as a measure of goodwill by the service and in line with relevant provisions of the company's uh, Income Tax Act. And they are also saying that uh, this, is, this extension is a one-off gesture for, by the service for this uh, 2022 year of assessment on company income tax. And um, all those people who are filed within that period of extension will not be subject to late filing, so they can easily get in. Yeah. So um, the federal government has condemned um, a call by five United States <laughs> Republican senators asking for Nigeria to be redesignated. Thanks for qualifying as... it, Republican senators. Yes, <laughs> it was qualified in the papers. <laughs> um, for asking for the redesignation of Nigeria as a country of particular concern based on persecution, alleged persecution of Christians. So, of course, our Minister for Information was saying that this is based on false premise. That, first of all, constitutionally, we are, um, Nigerians are allowed to practice their religion freely. But the problems we have is a criminal problem. We have bandits, kidnappers, and they don't care your religion. This criminality affects everybody across board. So to ask for us to be redesignated only, especially after we've just been taken out of that list, was wrong. So okay, that's all we can take us. on front page review. When we come back and move on to our first guest. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Your view will be right back. So joining us now to discuss environmental sustainability is the director, 
Business Development and Communications Nigerian Conservation Foundation. Mr. Uchina Achunini, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yes. <laughs> so since Mariam got into these environmental family issues and we <laughs> are constantly issues. reminded of how animals prey on each other, not at the detriment of the environment, but we prey on them at the detriment of, the, of, um, of our society and of the environment. So how do we correct this anomaly? Okay. Thank you for having me. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm happy you said since Miriam got yes, to Yes, so she has been educating all of us. Uh, please, you need to drag everybody in. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, all hands need to be on deck for us to be able to make any, meaning, any meaningful impact. Um, she will tell you and all of us at NCF and those who are in, uh, involved in uh, everything about conservation and the protecting and conserving the environment that there's a whole lot of work to be done. And it's, uh, it's not something that only NCF and a few who are involved in it now be able to achieve. So the, 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 there's a whole lot of work to be done because uh, the, the, the planet, the earth that we live in and the ecosystem that we are a part of, uh, so man is a part of a, an integrated and functional ecosystem that has, has other components, the forest, the sea, um, the land, the animals in it. And each of these play a critical role to ensuring that there's a balance in the ecosystem. So what you're noticing in our environment now is the imbalance of our actions and inactions are, are causing on the ecosystem, the environment where we live in. And if, it, if nothing is done about it seriously and uh, very fast, um, what we're seeing today uh, is going to get worse. Mm. So people are already crying that things are getting bad, um, the climate crisis, cl uh, climate change, the crisis and all of that that come with it. So everybody has got a role to play. Right. So when you see a millipede, you should not kill it because there's a role that that millipede cr plays in creating the balance in the ecosystem. Right. The earthworm that you see, all of, as little as they are, uh, so you, you, uh, it's not an advert for her, but she wrote <laughs> a book uh, about vultures. Yes. Uh, so many people think, in those days growing up, we used to call it uh, Udelenerios, a vulture that eats cops. So you mm -hmm. even don't want to get close. You even want to kill it or throw something at it when you see it. But now we'll be made to understand that these are the best cleanup crews that you can have in the society, and without them, a lot of epidemic and diseases would be on okay. widespread. Okay, so um, I've been hearing this uh, phrase, only one earth, only one earth. Everybody's just only one earth. A few day, a few months ago, she went with candle, they were burning candle for only one earth. And I, I'm trying to understand the significance, what, what it means exactly, and why are we happening on only one earth? Uh, yeah, so it's important that we're happening on it because there's only one earth. So if there's a second one you know about, <laughs> you can tell me. Uh, the, the last time I checked, we have just one earth. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we lose this one earth, uh, we don't have another place to go to. Um, so yeah, Elon Musk and others are talking about mass and all of that mm -hmm. until they, they secure that. But even when they do, it won't be like the earth. So we have only one earth that all of us live in. Um, and it is our responsibility to, you know, to protect that earth and uh, secure it. Uh, when uh, the late chief uh, N.S. Shaneko, um, the former head of state, spoke at uh, the NCF uh, um, chief SLA do memorial lecture that we hold every year, Twen this year we're going to be having uh, the 20th edition next year, uh, he said that uh, the earth, the planet, is no one's property to destroy, but it is everyone's responsibility and everyone's property to protect. So it belongs to us, one earth, and we must do everything on a daily basis. So every action you want to take, you must ask yourself, is there a negative impact that action will bring on the earth? If there is none, you go ahead. If there is, you need to now ask yourself, is there another way I can do this? You know, so that's why they start talking about alternative way of living and doing things. Um, is there any, another way that we can generate light apart from burning diesel that is emitting a lot of uh, carbon dioxide in the air. The, your cooking, is there another better way, climate-friendly way of cooking that we can do to make sure that the one earth that all of us live in is secure? And that all these uh, things that we think do not do anything that are our support, uh, that provide support services to us, 
all the things in the ecosystem we mentioned, all of them work towards the well-being of man. That's, that's the, the, the interesting thing. Everything that you see in the ecosystem, they all work towards the well-being of man. But right. man, ignorant, okay. is also working against those. Yeah. Right. those. So um, <clears throat> I understand that um, the earth, this is, this is all we have. And many times we don't see the impact in terms of when people change their environment. I had a cousin who was asthmatic in Nigeria for all our years growing up together. And simply by moving away from Nigeria, moving away to a different part of the world where um, things are kept in its natural form, he reduced his attacks that he had. And sometimes you talk about people living in their house and they put on the generator and the generator fumes cost them to lose their lives. Really sad situations. So I understand the importance of environment in terms of how it helps us to keep it clean. But the average Nigerian is looking at my everyday livelihood. If I, I need to cut this um, tree so that I can use it for firewood, I need this coal because I cannot afford kerosene. What, how can we... How can we make sustain, uh, environmental sustainability for the average small person, person that is thinking every day how to live, and yet we think it's sustainability? It just seems like we're speaking English to them. Okay, uh, yeah, so he, he, th that's why um, things that has to do with conservation environment are uh, almost like eradicated in the background. So when you come to sustainability, sustainability has three uh, components. You have uh, the the, the the profit, the people, and the planet. Mm -hmm. And the planet, the three pieces, the planet, they put it on the, at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, uh, it, the way it's, it's looked at now, it should be the other way around. The planet should be at the top, where every other person is. Mm -hmm. is, is. So we have to uh, start letting people know that it is important for us to find a way how to live in harmony with nature. Mm -hmm. And that is what we, we, we try to preach. Uh, so ours is not, you know, trying to preach it like it does it to not look real. Our yeah. programs at NCF are taken to the communities. We have presence across Nigeria, and in those places, we are thinking of okay, that woman that lives at a mountain resort, mm -hmm. where the weather is minus something degrees, how will she be able to survive in that place? So we're talking about how to get. Um, some things for them to use to heat themselves in that area. So when you're preaching about sustainability, the person will be listening to you because you are addressing the person's needs. I think I have huge programs to that place to, to train them on right. and all of that. And uh, <clears throat> so the, tomorrow we'll, you will be listening to uh, um, Sir David Attenborough talk about living in harmony with nature. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's what he has preached for the uh, more than 95 years he's lived on, he has lived on Earth. And we are bringing him on this uh, program tomorrow to talk to people about how to live in harmony with nature. With the cleanup crew. Okay, so my question would be, in what way would you say, or have you noticed any response towards this continuous sensitization and education of Nigerians especially um, about environment? Have you seen any change in lifestyle or positioning with corporate bodies and government policies? Yes, um, so we've seen a lot of uh, uh, um, interest, rise in interest from people, government, um, corporate organizations, and individuals. So when you look at the government, you will see that um, Nigeria has been participating in most of all the uh, uh, environmental uh, programs going, ac going on across the world. Um, last year, the president was, was at Glasgow at the COP26 uh, event where he made a commitment that by 2060, we are hoping to achieve the net zero emission. Other countries are thinking of 2050 and all of that. So um, a few days ago, him and the, the Minister of uh, State for Environment, uh, Chief Sharon Ikazo, we are in Portugal, another program. So a whole lot is happening in that area. And NCF is working closely with the Federal Minister of Environment on that. When it comes to corporate organizations, um, the CBN, for instance, if you go there, you will see that they started enshrining some climate-friendly kind of practices. Uh, we are working with them to organize some workshop where we we'll bring all the banks together to review the banking sustainability principle that was uh, that came into life in 2012. Right. 
and how they are fed over time. And then individuals are getting, these are programs. At least we are writing books. Yeah, they are, <laughs> they are individuals are writing books. And these are programs before now, there's not much interest, so not so much so interest. So before I wrap up with you, let me just tell us about the program tomorrow. What is it about? What time? Can we, can we party? Do you have to pay to attend? No, what no, no. It? It's, a, it's a free event. So it's the 20th Chief Esededu Memorial Lecture. Okay. We are using it to flag off 40 years of NCF existence. Okay. SF, oh. SF has been existed for 40 years. Wow. Yes, and we're bringing so many uh, great people to come and be part of that uh, uh, event. She was talking about only one air. The team for that event is only one air. It's happening at Aji Presaitha Hall, okay. Muson Center, and it's going to start at 11 a.m. It's both a live, it's a live event, but we're going I to agree. stream okay. it oh. across all social media platforms. Uh, right now, we have, we have close to 3,000 people that have already started to attend. That's what I was trying to say, that individual interest is also Building. increasing, oh, right. and increasing by the day. So. Uh, people who want to listen to Chief Sir David Attenborough, the ex British broadcaster and uh, world renowned naturalist, should tune into that event tomorrow and uh, hear other people from uh, the British High Commission, the Canadian High Commission, and uh, the Minister of, of State for Environment. They will all be there to talk about wow. only one earth. And then Fantastic. Mr. Environment, Mr. Desmond Ejekudumi, will be the moderator telling us how to live in harmony with. Nature. Fantastic. Thank you so much, sir. It was a pleasure having you. Thank well done. You. And thank you. We, I mean, we hear all the work you do with the NCA from Mariam. It's a, it's a great job, and we will continue to support you the best we can on this front. Please keep putting them on. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we can take on this segment. When we come back, we'll move on to the next segment. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Your view will be right back. Thanks for staying with us. So our next guest is a special advisor to the Lagos State Governor on Roads and Infrastructure, Engineer Aramidi Adeyoye. She will be discussing the state of Lagos Roads, what the current administration met on ground, what they have done, what they're doing, and plan to do. You can join the conversation at 081270 687-0913907694. You can also tweet towards activity. Can you please hashtag your view TV so we can read your tweet? It's good to have you, madam. Thank you. Good morning, ladies. So for having me on your program. Lagos Roads. Many people today um, are complaining, especially the rains have come. Mm -hmm. And um, you see on social media, we know we had the, the uh, I think the permanent sec for the Ministry of Environment has come to talk to us several times on how we can ensure clean out our drainages, you know, so that, because when the rains come, they've been warning us since January, the rains are coming. But now the roads, as we see it right now, many people are still complaining that we have bad roads. Although we know the government is doing a lot in building roads here and there. Could you give us in a nutshell what has been done so far since Governor G.D. Babajide Songulu's administration started? Thank you, madam. Um, so let me just go back um, down memory lane. In 2019, when we came on board, uh, we made a solid state of, of the roads. So much so, we had to declare a state of emergency. Mm. Uh, that saw us getting eight multinational contractors attack the problem, and then also with the public works operation, just be able to stabilize. And in doing that, we told ourselves, we will not do things in an unsustainable manner. So when you pick a major arterial, it was that bad. Even the major arterials were not spared. Eco Road was one big, one, one example that comes to mind that you see massive craters on your, on, your, on your major area from the airport. So we said, what do we then do? You have axle loads on these roads that are not controlled, so you don't have way bridges. The drains or the outfalls, because of our habits, we will never, we will never regularly dislodge. And so when the rains come, we always come with this. Most of our roads are in flexible pavements, they're in asphalt. And so in no time, because the drains are blocked, nowhere to flow, it comes on the roadway with the asphalt, and then it disintegrates. Mm. So we then said, we will take where we see that there is a, a drainage issue. We will address it and do that thing in a rigid pavement. And so that saw us taking road section from Lamata in, in Ketu all the way to Mile 12 in concrete. Also some strategic parts of Ikorodu Road in concrete pavements. And then the underpass tunnel at Odoyalaru 
that's one perennial gridlock, which everybody, for several years, every time that they repair it, within three months, it goes back again. And so we did it in rigid pavement, and everybody can attest to the fact that in the last, at least so, over a year now, it's raining now because you're driving on concrete. The water just glides. You glide over it, and there is no puddle anymore. And so that's what we did to stem that and then use our public works corporation to begin to do a, ment a routine program with that's called zero tolerance to potholes. Mm. So you take inner roads and some critical networks and then begin to stabilize them. We also identified to say, OK, we must open up new roads. We must make every part of Lagos livable. So new openings, places like Ijede, we did it, opened it up. Places like Kobashi Kumade Road, that's also a road that for the last... So that road has been built three times, and each time it has failed. It's failed because fundamentally we didn't address the issue. So we told ourselves there is no point. If we're going to build this in a sustainable manner, pick the problem, confront it frontally, and then deal with it. And so that's source. And what's the issue? It's a drainage issue. So Shekumade has a major outfall that goes all the way to Shagamu. Over the years, either because of the size and the capacity of the drains, you, we didn't do what we needed to do. But this time around, we said no. We'd actually have the deck on power there. We'd have a line canal together with the Office of Drainage Services. We've taken care of that. And in another, maybe in another two, four weeks or so, that road should be ready for commissioning as well. Okay. But we have sorted that and it's done. We also said to ourselves, we will do some form of urban regeneration. Make every part livable. Areas that look like they're already in a deplorable manner, regenerate it. Create the, the networks into that place. And then in no time, developers will come and that place, of course, improves. Okay. So I think we've done a lot in that, in that uh, sphere. Okay. Um, obviously, um, three years down the line, a whole lot has been done in terms of rehabilitating the roads. Yeah, the, this season, this is the worst season to come on TV for anybody doing what you're doing because any little challenge that you still have is more exposed when we have rainfall. One of the biggest challenges we have in Lagos is most of our roads, most of Lagos is below sea level. And we have a bad habit. We, either we, we are not clearing our drainages properly. So the good work that is being done, because I know the kind of work that went, that went on on Okwebi Road, but right now, today, I am very sure with this rain, Okwebi is flooded. So in our road construction, are we putting into um, cognizance the fact that we might need to raise the roads higher, or we're just trying to sort out palliative measures to temporarily fix the problem. Why exactly do we still have such level of flooding, despite the fact that these roads have been done once or twice within the same administration? OK, so let me thank you for that question. Let me tell you something. A road is as good as its drains. If you do not have a, a good drain, that road will fail. And there are several instances. A typical one that comes to mind is Lake Eco Expressway. That road was done 40 years ago as a rural road. So you expect that you will use normal, the road, the runoff from the surface of the roadway, you will take shoots to carry it and it percolates down the ground and it's fine. It could survive for 35 years or 32 years that way. But the last 10 years have seen massive development along that corridor. People are built, so even the outfalls where it could percolate to are all blocked. Mm -hmm. So there is nowhere the, the water is draining to. And so in no time, the road is going to fail. So what you're seeing on a typical place like Lake Eco Expressway is a failure of the pavement because there's no, there no drain. Hmm. So as a government, we envisage that there are developments around that corridor. Lake is the fastest growing corridor. You have, it's, it's almost like the economic nerve center for right. Lagos now. You have the Dangote refinery. You have a lot of developments. You have Alara City. You have, so we then thought, we can't wait for this to catch up on us. What we'll begin to do is let us take it from Ekpe backwards and change the pavement, raise the road, create the outfalls, because there were no outfalls before. So that saw us awarding 18 months ago about 18 kilometers of that road from Ekpe to Eleko Junction. In another two weeks, that portion of the road in phase one is done. Anybody is raining. So you're still coming back. You're still coming backwards. So we're coming back. Oh, okay. We're coming back. So it's in rigid pavement, it's not in flexible pavement because. By our habits, we do not like the way bridges are there. There are checks for us to, to behave well, to correct ourselves. But because in this climb, we oftentimes, when the way bridges are constructed, we don't, we don't like to go on them. So people carry excess axle loadings that you cannot, you cannot uh, control. So one of the ways out was, okay, let's do this in rigid pavement, using, modern, using um, the codes, put a factor of safety that even when they carry all of these excess loadings, the road will still survive. Right. 
So that's what we're doing, and we're gradually coming. Okay. And so for people around Lekki Corridor, they wonder why have we not gotten to Abraham Adesanya, because that's actually where it's supposed to end. So because it's a, it's a big chunk, it's a, yeah. infrastructure that's costs it. money. Yeah. It costs money, particularly when Time. you want it in rigid pavement. So we took it in bites. Okay. Let's, take, let's do this first phase, and then we'll take the second phase, and then we can close up the third phase at Abraham Adesanya where the Fort Milan Bridge is going to take off from. I'm really, really sorry. I need to just still ask that question because I, I do real estate in that axis and I can say for a fact that the population that they are, we're seeing there is, is a fraction of what is going to happen and we're not planning ahead with the roads. The roads that are being done are good, concrete roads, but they are small. There's already, tra like, the, the, I can foresee the kind of, of traffic that would happen in that So lanes. what you had initially was a falling road carriageway. Right. What you have now, you have six. You have two, two, four inclusive of a dedicated lane for the, for the yeah. trucks, articulated yeah. trucks. So in total, you have six lanes, aside from your median, your road furnitures, and aside from your walkway, aside from your slip roads. So you see some houses that you cannot enter because it's a major expressway. You cannot just be crisscrossing. Yeah. It's a simple, it's a transportation highway design yeah. thing. You must put those people on the slip roads that they come in and then ultimately get on merge. merge. Okay, let me tell you, the time. first time I'm hearing that, slip roads, I like that, I like the sound of that. So um, I saw a video um, a few days ago on, I think, um, Ajala, Ujjayi area, and it was flooded to, like, massive flooding. I used to live around that area before, and I knew that... Um, the government had done a bit of the roads. It's not as bad as it used to be. But I'm wondering, what's the plan for maintenance? Because we do the roads, and then everybody goes away. And after a while, we realize that we are back to the first problem that we try to solve. Is there any plan that you have mapped out to maintain this road, especially these ones that you are working on, yearly, quarterly? And like okay, so we have so the public works. That's where the public works comes in. Uh, the, there's a unit inside public works that does C2 the silting of drainages at critical locations. Ordinarily, it's a work, there's a gang, there's a gang, an effort gang in Office of Drainage Services where they desilt all of this. But we don't wait. When we see that there's a road that is going to be affected, uh, we call the attention of ODS to it, or better still, the team from Public Works, they move in to be able to abate some of this um, and avoid failures on the road. A typical road that comes in mind is Ecosi Road. You will recollect that about two weeks ago, there was almost like a, a, a total cut off of the road because there was a major outfall, there was erosion, a major outfall, and that road was actually going to disintegrate into two. Mm -hmm. So we, we moved in immediately and surveyed that. I tell people, once you don't have a drain, you don't have a road. Mm -hmm. It's simple. So that rain, because there was no outfall when the, the, the intensity, the, the torrential rain coming, was actually going to cut off that road into two. So we came in, stabilized, and then we could move on. So there is a unit gang in Public Works Corporation that does that maintenance in collaboration and in support also together with the mm. Office of Unit Services. They also have an effort gang where they do that. All if right, you build me... a road very well, I will tell you, there is no reason why that road should not last minimum 25, 35 years. Mm. If you do your regular maintenance, and I can tell you roads that typically this government, the state government, has built over the years that has survived and lasted. Typical okay, ones Colonial... like um, <laughs> Adelareku is, is one typical road. Yeah. Where is that? That's in Victoria. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was done in 2003, yeah. so 19 years ago. Yeah. Aola Road was done in 2020, so 22 years ago. Kudra Tabela Way was done yeah. in 20, well, 1999, so yeah. you're talking about 23 years ago. Mm. If, okay. if, if, if you have a road that is draining very well, and you keep checking all your outfalls, you keep cleaning your regular maintenance, well, asphalt does get tired, so at some point in time, you might mill it, resurface, but that road should survive. Yes. Yeah. Let me get you. Okay, so talking about, you know, all the work you've done and the fact that drainages are important, there's this road, like when we're living here now and you're driving towards the third mainland, you know, there's the road that veers off to the Bagada Express. Shaluisa. That's so, goes into Shaluisa. Estate. So, right, so there's work that's been done. This particular area I'm talking about, there's like a valley of sand and, and rocks. So above it are, you know, houses. But there's a sharp um, so a embankment, slope. Embankment, Good. So embankment. Yeah, yeah, I think it was. I think it's a man-made embankment actually. And then on the other side of the road, so there's a road in between. The other side of the road is like a huge field. And on this particular day when it was raining, there was water just coming down this slope and water from the field onto the road. So water from two places. Yeah. And for me, I feel that if this was. Um, maybe like five hour rain or something, it would cause serious, you know, issues. 
Okay. Because just like a two hour rainfall, many cars were already submerged. It was just really the big SUVs that you know were able to pass through. Do you, are you aware of this road and what's the work and when is it going to start or finish? Okay, so I'll, I'll tell you now. What you're talking about, you're talking about, that's a part of the Third Milan Bridge. That road is a federal road. You're veering back into Bagada Express. Yeah. And I know, I think I know the particular spot you're talking about. So you have this embankment, like a five meter embankment, that is not slope protected, mm -hmm. which means each time there is erosion, you will find the, the rain erode the material and it comes in, it, it clogs in the drain, mm -hmm. it gets filled up. When that is done, it then comes on the roadway. Mm -hmm. The sizing of that, of that trapezoidal drain is an issue. It's a federal road, and I think with the state, Lagos state government, we've approached the federal government to say, you have an issue here. Let us see your solution to this problem. Whoever is the contractor that is working for you, let us look at, let us look at all of the figures, the sizing, and then tell you what exactly would work for this area. Because obviously, your rainfall intensity over a return period, depending on what they've used for their design, we find that it looks like it's inadequate and you need to increase the sizing. We've done that, we've done that, we've learned that complaint, and I think they're taking note All right, of that. let me, let me, let me, because you mentioned this issue of federal road, it's a major problem we have. Because any, many times we're having this conversation, they'll tell you, oh, this is the federal road, you can't touch it. And, I, and I'd like to link that up to the Badagri, because when you came here, the first time you asked for was Nima. And I can understand why, because when we came here for Nima, but <laughs> Nima is not here today. But she's always consistently complained about that Badagri corridor all the way so to Badagri itself. Badagri itself. That road, and we, when we talk to, to people from government, they say, oh, it's federal road. Dangote came the other day. The, federal, the, 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 the presidency was there to come and check up the roads. What is the status of that road? Because... You are building the blue line, the real line to, 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 that, to that axis. It's not yet ready. People in that area are having difficulty coming to work on the mainland. So how, how, how what's been done? Okay, thank you. Um, so I agree with you. That's one stretch that is, um, that is, it looks like it is huge. But with planning, I think we can achieve it. So from Eric Moore National Theatre Junction to Badagri Main Town is a 60 kilometer. The concession we have as a state is on 22 kilometers, ending at Okukumaiko. The remaining 38 kilometers is in the purview of the federal government, which they have concessioned under the HDMI program. But on the 22 kilometer where the state is working, we are almost rounding up our own side of it. Before the end of this year, we will be done with our segments from Tene Zero to Okukumaiko. To okay. Beyond Okukumaiko, it's a federal government thing. We do not have concessionary rights in that corridor, and you cannot- Can you get concessionary rights? So, so there are steps and procedures to it. Um, and if you recollect, the minister said that if you do work on our roads, first you need to get approval before you can work on our road. And even as a state, when you work on it, you need to inform us, and then we will not even refund your money. But we realize that negotiations, you can't keep explaining to the citizenry that yeah. this is the, the federal, federal road, government. this is the state, yeah. state road. So we go sometimes to say, come, in the interest of, of the our people. Own, of the people, let us go do this. And every time we do this, um, Surah, when you're ramping up to Surah, mm. that place about three weeks ago or so, because it was causing traffic, public works did go, mill up the old place, did the asphalt. So what we do is, for the sake of the citizenry, we just catalog all of the things that we have done on the federal side, and we leave it till the day when we can do negotiations to say, we did resurface for you on Marina, over 6,000 square meter, just to make people able to go. We did this for you, we did this for you, and then we show you the dates, the photographs, and then, of course, we will resolve it at some point in time. But we look at, we consider the citizenry, and that's what we do. Because it sounds like bureaucracy. Uh, this is, this, well, our, the Nigerian problem is, is a bureaucratic absolutely. issue where well, paperwork, we have no concession, we're not, we're not concession to do this. I mean, no, we, but we, we consider the citizenry yeah. as first. Yeah. So we, we go back and say, irrespective of what this is, we'll document it because we cannot afford to go back and tell people this is why we didn't for do it. For the sake of information, for the, the, the reason this, hap this um, um, we will not pay you back issues happened was because for, for a long time, states were, were asking, we did one kilometer road for one billion naira, and they're expecting the federal government to just refund them yeah. those money. So those, they had to just put a bit of check to it. Of course, there's room for improvement, but my concern, Nima has said this thing on the show, I have experienced it. I was, my parents live in Mautu, and because I had to... I, was, I went through first stack and I was coming back. There was no turn off. I made the huge mistake. I went to trade fair and I got on the express. And there was no way to turn off from the express. I had to drive all the way 
to Orile before I could get off the express. The roads are ramped off. The service lane, by the way, is you have trail, um, what do you call those? Tankers parked ah. on the service. So you cannot even stay on the service because if you're on the service and you're stuck there, you can be there the entire day. Now you come on the express, you cannot turn veil. into, you can't veil off at all. There are just mini, very little mm. um, turn off from the expressway. How, wh why was that designed? Okay. Because people like driving on that road feel like it is structurally impossible. The framework is not favorable and it needs to be reviewed. That's I'll let you answer that question after okay. this break. <laughs> like, I'll let you take okay. care. Thank Stay with us, we'll be right back. Stay tuned. Your view will be... Thanks for staying with us. So before the break, you asked a question. I like yes. the... Uh, Was the there a design flaw in that place? Okay, thank you. Um, Lagos Balagri Expressway was conceptualized in 2009. It's a major trans highway national route, so it's a major expressway. It's not a metropolis route. So, because it's designed as a major trans highway, West African highway route, it's not, it doesn't allow for crisscross. I think we need to understand the philosophy of the design and then know exactly what it is. It is not a design failure, it is intended to do, behave and function in that capacity. What you have, it's a failure of the parallel roads mm. because there are parallel roads that should, you shouldn't come on the expressway, you should ideally use those back-end roads. Yeah. So a typical road will be that you leave, when you leave Ijara Causeway, you go to Sarigomu, Sarigomu, you take Musafejo, Alaba, you mm. come out, mm. you pass through signals, mm. or you come out through Mbakado. So, so those are back-end roads yes. that you take. You don't come on the expressway believing that you want to come. So once you leave National Theatre, you come to Orile, Orile on the service lane, and that's why the service lanes. Are... So you have a two-lane service lane, you have your two-lane major, um, major um, uh, fast lane, and then, of course, you have your rail in the middle. Mm. That's why it's a turning expressway. But our habits, again and again, the service lane is where you find the yellow buses park and pick people, and that's, in fact, there are no two, there are no two lanes anymore. It's just half lane. We resolve that people are then forced to go on the major one, and then there is no allowance for them to just oh, talk. No. But if you were on the service lane, you can get to side streets yeah. and side roads. So it still boils down to our, our, our people, our habits, the way we are, which we must change. But in solving, the problem, well, they're they're solving, solving the problem. Solving the problem. So, Old Ojo Road. Old Ojo Road, and that's where people in Satellite Town, they cry to say, it looks like they have been abandoned. The state government is doing all it can to address all of these issues. So for Lagos, but it's not just, and I keep saying it, first, we must get the fundamentals right. There are no design flaws. That's the way the road is. Secondly, we do not have the whole 60-kilometer stretch to do. We have concessionary rights only on the 22-kilometer stretch. What goes beyond 22 is a federal government issue. So when I hear um, um, comments like, oh, um, from Okoko Michael, Afro Media, going down, it's, mm. this, it's because... Well, let me address that very quickly, because I know that the Minister of um, Works was in Lagos recently, when he went to Ghana, yes. and he said that um, he was complaining about the theft of uh, the materials from the, those in that corridor, saying that some of them took sand from the from the equipment from, the, from them and took out and built their own houses. So he has asked the, the government and the, the people within that area not to steal the materials, and has also assured the people within that area that the first quarter of 2023... To be, that road will be ready. So, if indeed the government, your government does to Lukoko Michael, we're hoping that by next, early next, first Q1 next year, mm. the other roads will be ready. And we'll take, we'll hold on to the minister for that. The minister that is very right, very, very right. I can tell you as a government, one of the difficulties or challenges that we have is people taking ownership. Yes. You have infrastructure that you have provided, you are, the contractor is even yet to hand over. You find people come in, pick up the slabs overnight, break them. Ah and remove the reinforcement in them. Mm. They I, cut the basis of, of, of tubular steel pipes, street lights, yes. for sale. Yes. They put I, them I in the scrap carry, market. Yes. They do it. The they iron, the, 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 the iron, they cover the gutters. Yes. They steal those the things. The gratings, exposing people to danger uh -uh. while they're right. even walking or well, walking and walking. We know so these are yeah. things that we see on a daily basis. And I, as a government, we, that's why we say take ownership. We just don't want to build for you. We want you from day one 
take ownership, take it as if it's your. After all, this money is, a is funded, these projects are funded with taxpayers' money. It's your money. I'll come to BCM, take this course and hold it for a while. Juliet, are you there? Malima Shaw. Yeah, yeah, good morning. You're live. Go ahead, please. Okay, so um, I really want to ask, uh, first of all, I want to comment the government of His Excellency, this candidate, this show, 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 because community here, roads here, are well fixed. Yeah, and the community roads here in Atlanta show are completely. If you go to the community, to the village, you find out that there are so many things. There are so many roads that are so. What is the legal state do to ensure that the community roads are well fixed? Thank you. Okay, did you get that? Community yeah. roads. I think if I got her very well, what is the state government doing to ensure that inner roads are being done? Because yeah. where she lives in Alimo Show. Okay, so madam, uh, thank you for that question. But Alimo Show, I would even say Alimo Show is a favored one. In Alimo Show, you have had this in the last two years, major arterials, not, well, so you've had Ishuti Road. That's a six kilometer road that leads to the jetty. Done. Ready for commissioning any moment from now. You've also had roads like Ishuti, about three and a half kilometers done. Currently, we're doing a Kesson Badore, done. So there are roads that we are fixing that will ease connectivity, and they also speak to this government's intent of the intermodal transport system. You, if you will know, there are state roads, and there are also local government roads. So what we're doing as a state is pick those major state roads, get them fixed. Use the public works to also do some of the inner roads, while we also expect some form of um, cooperation from the local government side to also address the local governments also have the works department that they can also take on, on some of these routes. And it, some of them are they're actually living up to the expectation in Ajegule that the, the chairman there is because it, it tells you what his program is, what he can what he can fix, it will it will share with you. Do you by chance are you going to be able to do another one in the next season? Also the solo. I think one or two. So I, I always implore all of local government chairmen to say Come up with your program. What exactly do you want to fix in your locality? Uh, so that the state government will then come on and then add on more. Yeah. So I have because it's a collaborative effort. So I have yeah. a few. So I'm going, to, I'm going to round up on the, because we didn't quite finish the, uh, the Lagos Badagri Expressway. Yes, uh, so Should I just read out the tweets about that Lagos Badagri Expressway yes. so that you just okay. respond to it at once? Thank you. So this person says that, oh, um, Lagos Badagri Expressway, this is flourish for between Okokomaiko and Afromedia is bad. The suffering is too much. The road construction company blocked the partially completed site, making people to lose their property as there's been. And they also get robbed the moment that there's traffic. Okay, so that's something to take on board for the federal side because I said the limits. Um, and like I said, the city, they, don't, they can't differentiate what's the federal road yeah. or what is the state road or yeah. where are the limits. We don't care, really. So it's something when, when we take all of this feedback uh, between the director of works from the federal side and myself, we interact and we tell them all of this and they know exactly what to do. Um, I, I actually, I feel, I feel for everybody living there, I wish that project had finished before now, but it's something that both governments, both on the federal side and the state, we're working as seriously at doing. Okay, so, so to the side roads... Uh, what we're doing is to ensure that parallel, the roads backing the main ones are functional. Aside enforcement that you can go on the service lane to the places where you are going to. When you go on the main express lane, you do not have opportunity for a detour. If you take it, the next place you would go in is at mile two that you make your turn in. That's terrible. Ah. Because it's a, you have to understand the philosophy. Yeah, it's a, it's a major was... trans highway route. It's not a metropolis, your inner road. Yeah. So, so those sides, so, so those sides, so, so the service lanes, for example. Yeah. Is, why can't we get? So why can't we get the boys, the good boys of Lagos, to clear it for us? So those buses don't stop on the road because we're saying there are no but jobs. But the boys are available. Let us engage them to clear those places. It's clogged up. That's one thing that Lasma, the Minister of Transport, together with Drainage Department are working at. I can tell you something. Nigerians, sometimes it's, it's a bit difficult. Oh, of course, to govern so, us. We, we, know, govern. we know, don't paint it okay. nicely. So, we know. We so know. <laughs> I think it's not because government does not have the will. We have yeah. the will. Yes. But you could, last month would go in today, they will succeed, but they will come back the following week. Yeah. I think it's an attitude that we need to sit 
and maybe it's training. The, the local government, is... man. The local governments are ineffective yes, because the I'm local government will show that, yes, I am in charge. This is my local government. Yeah. This is because you know your boys. Yeah, they them. live there. You know their mothers. You know their lives. You know they, so local governments are ineffective because if we have them very effective, they in the Mimauto Hand, area, they, know, they can handle them. Yeah, they can. Not the state government. I agree with you. I, so my area that's, something, that's something that uh, it's good, good feedback. And we'll see what we can do to, to that. Yeah, so I have. Um, um, so the parallel roads here. around Ojo, Ojo, no, Ojo that falls road. very you. soon. So very soon, um, together with the Central Bank of Nigeria, because that's a road in rigid pavement. And you ask, why are we doing it in rigid pavement? That's a major tank farm area zone. Yes. Over to the number of trucks that daily load on the tank from the tank farms, you will not believe the numbers. And Lagos is making money. Lagos is not making money. <laughs> <laughs> To fix that, the road is in billions. It's in rigid pavement. It's a seven-kilometer stretch. But as a government, we know we, we see the sufferings. We know it. And what we decided to do was pick up the major route that goes to the tank farm, okay. Munuri Bubamara uh, Road. It's called mm -hmm. Munuri Bubamara uh, Road. It's in rigid pavement. But one of the difficulties or challenges of working on that road is that 24/7 they are always loading. Mm. It's hard to work. It's hard to work. So what do you achieve as your output wow. under that circumstance? Because your traffic management plan in a, in a place where everywhere is all logged, is all clogged. So one of the things that we say to the stakeholders is engage. Between, between the tank farm owners, between the local government, between the satellite tank um, owners, to say, let us agree on the time for loading so that the contractor knows I can only work within this hour to this yeah, hour and right. fix. That way, we'll be able to reduce the construction. Let me take this call. Yakub has been holding for a while. Sorry about that, Yakub. Good morning. You're live. Yeah, I, yeah no problem. But you're going to send me 100,000 cash. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Yeah. yeah. Good morning, madam. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Uh, let, let me just say one or two things quickly. Uh, the last caller mentioned about the uh, community road. Yes, I can speak for, I guess, the local government here. Yeah. Uh, to be sincere with you, I think the local government, the, uh, our able chairman is really, really trying to be sincere. I can count almost, almost eight streets that is on construction, as I'm talking to you in my area. At the same time, the, the work is going on simultaneously. And then about the people that uh, cut away the materials, Madam, I can tell you for free, do you know those laborers? That the, the, the people that are giving the job done, giving those guys that come and help us do some certain things, they will come back midnight and begin to cut away those things. And then, even though they sold it to the people living in the community, and then the people living in the community, they cannot just go there and pick it on their own. If, if the if people they that are not... working there are not support them, yeah. Yeah. that is one. And then the other thing about our, our express road, madam, this the truth must be saying here. The people that cut major old dogs in Lagos say it is NURCW. Why <laughs> well, am I saying that? Just go and check in and find the other bridge. There is no bus. At that point, very particular place, no garage. These people will stop the yellow bus mm, at the middle of the road. You that you are driving back. You don't know what is happening. When you go there, you find out that it is NURCW that is stopping those yellow bus and collecting the money. And then mm -hmm. I, had, I had, I think, two months ago, or last month. That the government, the, the, the judge, they have given the judgment that these people should stop collecting this money. But they are still continuing. What are you doing to that? Good morning. Right. God bless you. Thank you, Yakub. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yakub. Like I said earlier on, um, it's a collaborative effort between the state government and the local government chairman. Um, I'm glad that you also you said it truthfully that Agege local government is doing well. A lot of the constituency roads also are in Agege. So Agege, just as we did the Penn Cinema, there are a lot of complementary roads all around. And that's what we do. We look at a whole locality and we try to complete the whole network. It's the same thing also in Ekwe. As you're doing all of those segments, the main, the main arterial, you complement the clusters. Um, in Alimosho, it's the same thing. Once you take a major one, you go back, the clusters you clean. And of course, I understand that you cannot fix all of the inner roads at a go. That's why the public works is there. And they're, they're trying their best within the limited resources that they have. Um, so the focus is on them, that all of the inner roads must come on stream at, at par with the standard, close to the standard that you have on the major arterial roads. So that's something for us in the uh, Ministry of Works. So NECA, yeah, uh, yeah, so that's, that's something that we're working at. Um, I know it's an issue, yes. but I, I know that the modality, there's something that we're working out. Yes. And I'm sure very soon 
uh, the state government would Even react, okay. react and announce yeah, what So exactly NECA says here the whole of Ejibo LCDA does mm. not have any good road. The road towards Ajao Estate from NNPC Terrible. is becoming bad. He said that Minister Fashola uh, fixed it at some point, but it's gone bad and yet there's no maintenance. And I also wanted to ask, for the inner roads that are being worked on, what is the quality control? How do you ensure that they use good materials to fix those roads so that not after a few months we still have the same potholes that we've had before? Okay, thank you. Um, so Ejigbo, Ejigbo is, that part of NNPC is on the federal side. I recollect that, um, like you said, the minister, they fixed it and it's not. When you have articulated trucks carrying 80 tons for a road that is designed to take 30 tons, <laughs> it's in, in no time, it's not, like, this is pure science. The road will give way. So one of the things that we did as a government coming on board, first, first set of things that we did was to establish the standard operating procedures that people will know that if you want to build a road, this is exactly what it takes to be. From the right of way acquisition to the stakeholders meeting, to the design, the outfalls, who, and who is giving who is signing off on each of the issues, ODS for the outfalls, uh, physical planning for the right of way, works, your design, everybody must sign off. So those SOPs were signed. As a cabinet, we did, we did, so those SOPs were passed as a guideline for everybody that wants to work. In addition to that SOP being passed was the KQC. For any contractor that will come to the Ministry of Work, the quality assurance and the quality control. And it goes right even from the kind of material you want to use, the specification. So we changed the specification of even semi-rigid pavement. Longer than from 30 MPA to 45 MPA. It's not just even the compressive strength. Also the splitting um, strength. To say even if you want to do interlocking pavement, this and this are the, the standards that it must have and the quality. So that when you use it, we are not, we are not having to repeat this road in the next one year. Right. So those quality assurance were there. As we did that, even for our own public works corporation, we established an in-house laboratory right. where the controls are there. The Marini plant, for the first time in 10 years, we did a turnaround maintenance. All of the consoles that were not working, we fixed them. So that when you say you are producing asphalt of this quality, you know exactly the quantity of bitumen that you are poured in, that your gauge, your dial gauge, everything function, it works. And then it also went into a lot of R&D. So the public works corporation, can, they can actually produce cold patch asphalt. It's really now, if I want to do if I'm compelled to do cold patch asphalt, I can lay because I have capability. Mm -hmm. yeah. So those are some of the things that we have done um, right. for the standards. And then capacity development. As an engineer, you must know what you're watching out for. Otherwise, you get to a site you don't even know. You're blank. <laughs> for the last two years or three years, we've done a lot of capacity development in in Ministry of Works as well as the Public Works. Capacity okay. development? For the, for for the, the engineers. engineers. For the engineers. Yeah. For training. Okay. okay, go ahead, Mary. Um, so this one may come from maybe a little bit selfish point of view, but um, I sometimes wonder if the Lagos State government sort of puts into consideration people's lives, livelihood, mental, emotional, you know, states in doing these roads. Because I live on Western Avenue. Mm. The bridge, as we know, underneath it, when that fire happened, that's the eco bridge. You know, there's work going on, so it's blocked on that axis. Then there's work being done at the Tejo Show area. Blocked. Then blocked. Then, you know, just different places. And it seems that for me to be able to get my child to school now, we have to wake up much earlier than normal. And I was wondering if, you know, the government could look at when they're doing roads like that in such a way that it Plans. gives us a little bit of, you know, leeway so that we can still go about our lives without just sitting in traffic with children for hours on end especially in the rainy season. Okay, thank you. Um, so I would say something. I feel the pain for Nigerians when they're in traffic. I sincerely apologize. We go through the same. On Thursday, I was on the Lake Epo Expressway corridor for five hours in that traffic. I, the commissioner for transport was equally in that same traffic. So I experienced it. It's not as if um, we go about in, in chopper or helicopters. We go through it. But one thing I must say is this. Disasters don't tell you that they're going to happen. But you can mitigate, you can avoid them, you can mitigate. So when we say the bridges are not places for people to stay under, in, in, in normal climbs, underneath the bridges are not where people stay. You don't put fire, you don't want to roast corn or roast things underneath the bridge. So invariably, we, it looks like we use our hands to destroy ourselves. <sighs> so when people go in and they destroy, because nobody knew that Palmer Bridge was going to was going to be burnt. 
He came and said, we were still battling, we were still trying to, because we just managed to come out of Third, um, Third Mainland Bridge. And even at that, the federal government has not finished, finished the work for the underwater concrete. They were still doing some investigations under the, the, the bridge, underwater, but at least away from the surface that people could go over. Only for them to hear this oh, one this happen. One. They had just managed to do a park Oshodi. A park Oshodi was also one that the trailer tanker that caught fire underneath the column. So it looks like before we do not have money. Before you one. finish one, another one happens. And so the, pro the program of the one at the Yaba Junction, the rail being done by Lamata, was ongoing. Yeah. Nobody foresaw what was going to happen for the mm -hmm. So it's difficult for you to say government should tell, to tell us and let us plan because we didn't plan for the Akpongbo. Mm. Mm. Well, we didn't plan for the Akpongbo. Yeah. I understand, exactly. but even before the Akpongbo bridge... And uh, then even for the federal right. government, the third mainland bridge, mm -hmm. the time they want to start is not something you have control over. It's subject to provisions in the budget when they have the Fund. money. Funds. So when they tell you we have to, we have reasons to start this work now, mm. you need to collapse your own program, shut it in, and make sure everything fits into it. That's what we do. So it's, 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 it's ongoing. It's ongoing. It's going for a long period of time. But I don't want to even dwell on that because I understand that the government is doing its best to make sure that this, you know, I, happens. I, I, and I, so my last story, and so to, to end it up is, what, what do you think in an ideal situation, like after doing most of the work, what would you like to see in, let's say, two, three years, so that we are not constantly trying to catch up? Instead, government is on the part of maybe just maintaining, and so what, has, what needs to happen in, the, in two or three years for that to happen? Thank you. Um, I think as a government, um, one thing we preach and we say is this. We, the vision that we want on this infrastructural growth, we know. We've demonstrated it even in the way we fund it. The last three years, I've seen the budget on infrastructure provision go up by as much as 25 percent, from 105 billion to 123 billion, 126 billion, and now it last this current year, close to 156 billion. Uh, so that tells you it's a deliberate investment in infrastructure. But we must, if we are doing this, the citizenry must also take ownership. Ownership, we must respect right of way acquisition. When they say this is the plan of government, I want to come and build a Fort Mainland Bridge. And I'm going to start from here to here. I have acquired and gazetted this corridor. It behoves the citizenry to, to respect that sanctity, to say government will come. It doesn't matter if they don't come in, in, in the number of years they say they will come. But they're definitely coming. Because when people violate it, you make it difficult for us to come back whenever we are ready right. to come and build. We have to and more importantly, that. it's that ownership. Even the little one that we have done, it's for people to take ownership when you see right. the infrastructure being abused. I think we need to bring to you back, Ma, it. because there's, there's a lot of conversation around ownership. Yes. I feel that, we, I, I mean, as I said it a lot, we've realized that many human beings can act like animals, mm. but we need some kind of um, enforcement to get them to work toward us. So I must applaud We need you, that, though. so we have to, but thank you very much, I, I don't envy so your job as a pleasure. As in, and you, as you displayed so much competence in the way you, you broke down. Thank all right. you. That's all we can take. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye for now. Thank you.